it occurred to me this past week, well, first of all, I thought last week was wonderful. It felt like we're back. Yeah, and, and it's great to see so many of you back here today. But it did occur to me that it now has been, oh, whatever, two and a half years or something, and I thought it was time to reintroduce to you the people who make this all possible. So I'm going to start with the leader of the band, and I'm going to ask these people to stand up or wave or... Yeah, the leader of the band, Judy Hunter. The tech crew, Bob Weimer, Ben Gunther, Jack Gustafson, Monique Shore from here at the library, and Barb Hansen, who isn't with us today, but important people, please. <laughs> Carla Erickson on speaker recruitment, and Carla's probably teaching a course or something like that today, but she helps us uh, find people such as Professor Gunther to come and talk to us. Scott Groon from the Mayflower provides refreshments. Yay. <laughs> Joanne Britton and Barb Lease on the welcome table. <laughs> set up, I mean, set up and the IT crew are kind of the same people, aren't they? You guys are setting up these chairs. Guess who's taking the chairs down? Everybody, that's right, and everybody who can. Um, and finally, uh, as percussionist, me, Janet Carl, bell, bell ringer, as you might, might recall from last week. Uh, let's see, a few announcements. We encourage uh, mask wearing, but we don't require it. Uh, we've, we got some feedback last week about, ooh, two donation pots are confusing, so now you see just one, and just don't even worry how it's going to be divided up. It's all going to work great. Um, turn off your cell phones right now or turn them down to vibrate if you haven't already. Turn on your T-coil if you haven't. Uh, Professor... Professor Gunther has said um, questions during the talk are fine, but if you've got a question, uh, raise your hand and Judy and I will run around with the microphone and ask you to wait on your question until we get there so that the question is clearly recorded. Um, and, and then, but he's happy to have questions uh, during his presentation. Uh, we will have a break time. And then when you hear the cowbell, yeah, come back. And please help put away chairs again, if you can. I am delighted to introduce Professor Michael Gunther, who's going to talk about Britain in the Age of Enlightenment. Mike is the chair of both the History Department and the Interdisciplinary Department of Science, Medicine, and Society at Grinnell College. He received his BA from the University of Virginia and his MA and PhD from Northwestern. He's married to Professor Elizabeth Prevo. They have a daughter, Jackie, and he likes to garden, sail. I question him about the sailing, but he goes out to Massachusetts to do that. Uh, and woodworking and various other crafts, and especially cooking. We look forward to your presentation very much. But I will gladly come down uh, into the audience and hand you the microphone when you have questions um, that way. Uh, over at the college, we're often using microphones, so it's kind of gotten used to it. But I have a tendency to sometimes my voice trails off. I'm just afraid this might not pick up as well. So um, welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for coming uh, to, to this talk as part of a three-part um, series, although you don't have to come to all of them, but uh, about Britain um, in the Age of the Enlightenment. Uh, just a brief word about, it's not a, we're not going to survey all of British history, obviously, in three sessions. Um, but I think one of the things that's most dynamic about the 18th century um, is the Age of Enlightenment. And I say this because British history, uh, the 18th century is sometimes a little neglected because it sits between two centuries of dramatic revolution and transformation. The 17th century that saw the English Civil Wars, the creation of a commonwealth, the abolition of the monarchy, 
the establishment of kind of the Anglican Church and just a, a cauldron of political, religious, and social change in the 17th century. And then the 19th century, obviously, the age of the Industrial Revolution, all of the kind of technological and political transformations. And so the 18th century can sometimes seem a little placid, a little calm, an age of great furniture, maybe, um, things like that. You know, there was a famous textbook in the 1960s by Dorothy Marshall that uh, 18th century Britain, the age of complacency, kind of just this you know, like kind of smooth running um, kind of period. But I think that's a caricature, and I think a lot of scholars now are drawn to the 18th century because they realize how dynamic and vibrant the Enlightenment was, and also imperialism. Those two kind of things transformed Britain in 1700. Like, there is no Britain. There's a group of different kingdoms united under one monarch by personal rule, but it becomes forged as a nation at the beginning of the 18th century. And it starts off with almost no territories, and by 1815, it has 43 colonies and rules. You know, the sun famously doesn't set anywhere on the British Empire by the early 19th century. And it transformed itself into kind of Europe's leading power, um, not only in terms of empire and the military, but in terms of commerce and in terms of ideas and science and things like that. So it is a really vibrant age, so we're going to explore that. Um, the three parts of the, the, the talks, the first one today I'm going to focus on um, the world of science and kind of the individual and what the Enlightenment meant to people. Um, and then next week I'll talk more about family life and spheres of kind of association and intimacy in terms of clubs um, and different groupings, um, guilds, things like that, kind of get at that world of people interacting um, with others. And then the third uh, lecture will be about society, and we'll get into things like religion and politics and kind of social reform and things like that in the Enlightenment. So those are the kind of the, you know, the evolution, the trajectory of where we're going. I apologize if you're thinking I, you know, maybe you don't want to be here for the science lecture today or whatnot, but um, the other thing that I wanted to say is um, the 18th century, like any period of time, can be fascinating or it can be a little off-putting if it's just a series of dates, a series of names, a series of kind of dry texts that have no life to them. I notice a lot of times people respond very differently when they go to a museum or any kind of setting where they're actually able to see the material and physical aspects of the past and kind of enter into a different world. I think that's one of the great joys of history is to, to learn what it was like to live in a different world in a sense. And so the other kind of theme uh, that I'm trying to explore is to look at history through objects. I think it was mentioned in some of the advertising. So today we're gonna look at three objects um, that I think help us kind of explore the world of the Enlightenment. Um, unfortunately, one of them is not the balloon, although that would be a great object, and I wanted to start the lecture with this, uh, uh, this painting of George Biggins ascending in this kind of Union Jack balloon. Uh, this was done in 1785, but we have to remember that by the end of the 18th century, people are flying, um, and to remember some of the excitement um, and some of the massive transformations that people witnessed. Um, during this age of enlightenment. I will say ballooning was seen as very scientific. The people that went up there took barometers with them, took instruments. It was seen as kind of um, a, a physical embodiment of chemistry and of all these kinds of new sciences um, and also about the spirit of exploration. So, all right. Let me start us with another image, um, a painting by Joseph Wright uh, that's a kind of classic. You'll see this often on the cover of books about the enlightenment, a classic tableau of uh, a philosopher that you see wearing. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about clothing in different parts of the class, but wearing what's called a banyan, a kind of loose-fitting robe that is seen as the appropriate wear for a philosopher or a man of science or a man of letters or a figure of the Enlightenment. Um, it kind of hides their formal clothing, which isn't supposed to matter as much in an age where everyone looks at the ruffles, the, the fineness of your silk, your class and your status are so determined by your clothing. So to have, almost like a lab coat, to have all that erased and instead enveloped in this loose fitting gown that you, know, that you can use in your study, or in this case, uh, interacting with other people to demonstrate how the universe works through this orrery, another kind of instrument that is wonderful to kind of unpack and explore um, and to see how people kind of understood um, principles, but one of the things I wanted to emphasize with this painting is that people did learn about science and did explore the world often through objects and through these kinds of experiences. So learning about the Copernican system or learning about new ideas of astronomy almost never were taught just simply as ideas in textbook, but instead were always taught through material objects. 
whether that's celestial globes or orreys and whatnot. Which brings me to the object that I want to talk about today here. Um, we're going to spend a lot, <laughs> fair amount of time talking about object W2806A slash D, um, a pocket case, a gentleman's pocket case of mathematical instruments here. Um, and I'm going to try maybe a little bit like the Antiques Roadshow to kind of explore the world that comes out of this instrument. I, I start this way because I think if I had to pick one instrument that best embodies enlightenment science and the kind of things I want to talk about, I would choose uh, the compass um, here, which is at the heart of that drawing instrument. I'll talk about some of these other things. I think the compass is almost a magical tool and helps us understand how people learn to think and to design and to imagine um, and to exercise reason and helps us kind of understand the whole cur culture and world of the Enlightenment. So this is the description that is in the catalog for this particular object, a copper alloy and ion single-hander divider. It's not particularly inspiring um, per se, but um, I'll use the word divider and compass kind of interchangeably, which they were used. So um, a divider has sharp points here. Compasses, um, and I'm imagining almost everyone here, this is what I love about the compass too, probably everyone here has used a compass at some point in their life. It's kind of a ritual of the second or third grade that you buy a compass and a protractor and don't really use them too often, but you know everyone purchases them. So it's, it's also a, an object, unlike maybe the orrery, that kind of all of us have some tangible knowledge of. But so dividers um, you know, would be used for measuring, but also for inscribing before there were pens and ink and graphite. You would inscribe into the vellum like a, a kind of a line and then fill that in later with ink. Uh, by the 18th century, um, often the arm of the divider will come out to have a pencil installed or a crown or a um, ink or whatnot. Um, but I chose this divider um, partly um, because of the owner of it, um, someone who I think is interesting to kind of explore today. So this is the divider that belonged to George Washington. This was his first divider. That pocket set were his mathematical instruments that he received as a young boy, probably around 12 to 13 years old. Um, some of you may know that George Washington was a surveyor, um, and so that may kind of, you may make some connections there about why he would have these mathematical instruments. Um, as we'll kind of talk about today, it's, it's hard to imagine a profession that does not use compasses in the 18th century. So as a, here's a painting of him, the first real portrait that we have with him wearing his kind of colonel's militia outfit. But any military officer would need to be adept with compasses. They would need to be able to read maps. Uh, they need to be able to do kind of fortifications and things like that. So, uh, but all kinds of different craftsmen, um, all, all different groups of people would use compasses. And I'm going to talk a little bit about his education. Um, we don't have any images of Washington himself surveying, but let me just show you uh, an image from a cartouche in the kind of decorative part of a map from the 1720s um, of William Mayo uh, in Barbados, just to get an idea of what a colonial surveyor would kind of be doing, and there they're using a plane table um, with a particular kind of measuring device, and they would be using compasses to convert all the readings from that table to the map back and forth. I also like this image because you can see the enslaved individuals as well that are accompanying. One has a circumferter, this kind of wheel to measure. Another has what are called kind of Gunter's chains, things like that. But um, one of the things that I find really interesting about mathematical instruments is that they're widely used by all kinds of and all groups of people in the 18th century. So you would kind of assume that math is an elite sphere and that you know George Washington becomes elite, so that makes sense. But I want to emphasize that um, women, um, different you know, enslaved craftsmen, anyone that has to do physical work in the 18th century um, that involves making things, and I'll get to why that's the case, but they would have been wielding these kind of mathematical tools and doing calculations. So. I kind of think that one of the interesting things when you follow the objects and the material path rather than just ideas, you start to see different groups of people at work and who contributes and how they contribute um, in important ways. Um, I also wanted to talk about the compass because it is such an icon of the Enlightenment. And this is William Blake's painting that's kind of famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, of Isaac Newton. Um, uh, the British Library, if anyone's ever been to the modern British Library that was built in the 80s, has an enormous bronze statue kind of of this reinterpreted um, in its front way. Um, and it's so evocative because Blake was opposed to what he saw as the cold rationalism of the Enlightenment and of its approach to kind of mathematizing nature. 
And so here we see Newton sitting in this kind of strange but wonderful like undersea scene where he's sitting on a coral reef. But instead of observing the things around him, he's just staring at a mathematical diagram, kind of wielding his compass, um, you know, to, to, again, not look at nature, but to look at his mathematical world on paper. Um, and the compass is an icon of the 18th century. Uh, many of you may be thinking in your mind, wait, what about like the Freemasons, right? Like the Freemasons have the compass as, like instead of uh, putting my fingers out like that, I'm gonna grab my own pocket compass set here so I can wield this. Hopefully I won't hurt myself with these sharp dividers. But um, uh, it becomes the number one kind of icon of the Enlightenment. Um, is the compass. Um, and it's partly because as I'll talk today about the way it lets you turn the world into numbers, lets you kind of turn the world into uh, a kind of paper world where you can design, you can study, you can record, and whatnot. So that's another reason to kind of um, focus on it. Um, here we have another, this is a more positive image of Newton. Uh, this is Isaac. This is the frontispiece to Voltaire's um, kind of work interpreting uh, Newton to the French Enlightenment. Um, and we see Newton at the top uh, wielding a pair of dividers on a celestial globe, explaining the laws of mechanics that kind of apply throughout the universe. And then his light radiates onto this muse here whose mirror kind of shines it down on Voltaire himself. And then at the bottom you'll see various mathematical instruments, again, kind of indicating that he's um, a man of science. Um, the muse that's here is actually based on uh, Emily de Chatelet um, here. Um, and this is my favorite portrait of an 18th century person using a compass um, here. This is her portrait. Um, Voltaire famously had a really hard time understanding Newton and really couldn't. And so it was Emily de Chatelet who kind of explained it to him uh, and kind of did most of the math behind it. Um, and you'll almost always see portraits of um, Chatelet wielding a compass. But I wanted to show this, and, and then I will go, come back to George Washington, because one of the greatest stories that I, that I enjoy um, is about how Chatelet got interested in mathematics, and it was through the compass. So when she was a young girl, um, uh, the servants and others would watch her father wield a compass. And most of the time, uh, a lot of what's interesting about a compass is you can make exact measurements, better than a ruler for instance, and you just kind of move it around to keep equal dividing. Or if you wanted to measure a curve, for instance, now you can use kind of fancy calculus and things like that. But people in the 18th century, and I won't poke a hole, but if you wanted to measure a curve, if you make your dividers small enough, you can just follow along the curve, rotating it back and forth, if that makes sense. Um, and so that you can measure what seems like immeasurable to people. And I want to bring this up because there's a lot of of handcraft and handwork and skills that are involved in wielding these compasses. So back to Chatelet, the servants, she, the servants saw her mesmerized by watching her father, almost like a whirling dervish, wield his compasses. And so they decided to dress up the compasses with, they made a little set of clothing to make them like little dolls so that she could kind of walk them around. And she thought that was fascinating. She played with them. And then she like threw the doll clothing away and was like, I want to play with the compass itself. And I want to draw circles and tangents and arcs. And so that was kind of her entree into the world of mathematics. And it's just a wonderfully evocative example, but as I'm gonna talk about, coming back to our friend George Washington, it's how most people got interested in math. Um, and maybe this is very resonant to me as someone who has uh, a daughter who's not enjoying math right now uh, and is struggling with it. Uh, she would, they would be the same age as George Washington. These are his copy books. These are his first kind of beginning of education that he did when he was about 13 years old. Um, it's also a, an important theme of the Enlightenment, which is a lot of Enlightenment education took place in the home or through tutors, not through the world of universities, which tended to be kind of stuck in a older traditional curriculum. So George Washington never went to college, never went to kind of really formal schooling. Instead, like many um, boys and girls, he built his own copy book, he created his own um, book and then recorded from different pedagogical texts, techniques that would educate him. And almost all children of this era started with geometry and started with wielding compasses here. Um, and I say this because I think it is a more exciting and fun, playful and creative thing to do math with compasses and drawing 
than it is with tedious calculation, which is what we kind of emphasize. And I, I'm not a school reformer. I don't know anything about modern day pedagogy, so I'm not trying to critique schools today. But I do want to understand, and myself going back to the 18th century, try to understand why people were so excited by compasses and by geometry and stuff like that. So these are, like I said, George Washington would have used those dividers to do all kinds of things. Um, here's the beginning of a geometric problem. How do you uh, divide a line, but also how do you make a perpendicular line, like a 90 degree angle? We're so used in our culture to going to buy a T-square or to buy a mold or to buy um, a template for something. We kind of forget that everything created on paper almost in the 18th century is created by hand. As Euclid said, you can create almost every geometric shape with just a set of dividers and a straight edge. Like, and out of that, you literally kind of generate everything. And so this is what children start doing. They start learning how to create all the shapes. How do you create a triangle? How do you create a circle? It's kind of simple. But how do you create all the polygons? How do you divide them? How do you know what's the center of a circle? If it's just a given circle, like if you want to find the center, these are all problems that are solved with a compass and have real world applications, not only in terms of like George Washington laying out land or surveying, but again, if you're a craftsman and you want to make any shape furniture or any shape item, you want to build an organ and you need cylindrical or elliptical shapes, like this is all learned um, through the kind of handiwork um, of working on paper. And here we just have a little closer up version of uh, Washington learning how to kind of not only um, draw perpendicular lines, but also to create kind of angles um, here. Uh, and he clearly didn't have, but was trying to imitate, the, some of the fancier dividers and compasses have a little wheel on them that's like dotted so that you can create these kind of dotted lines. He's clearly kind of doing it with a, 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 you know, a pen um, in different ways like that. Um, but there's about 150 pages of Washington kind of slowly learning um, to make his way um, through all the principles of geometry. Um, and I'm going to try to stress today that it's through that study of form and of understanding kind of proportion and understanding the principles of how things are constructed that people um, learned not only to create a lot of different things in this world, but they also learned to appreciate what, is, what is aesthetically pleasing, things like architecture, whatnot. Um, but I also wanted to kind of emphasize that uh, every, so here is an ex some, here's another example from Washington's piece where he's kind of doing a bit of surveying. Um, every compass circle, sorry, I don't know what's going on. Um, let me turn this off actually. There we go. So everything that is divided in this world of the 18th century science, whenever anyone looks at a you know, quadrant that has um, kind of degrees on it, whenever they look at a circumference, um, whenever they use a ruler, like one of the things you might ask, um, or maybe you don't ask yourself, but I kind of think about like, how do people divide rulers? Like how do you make exact increments on a line, right? That's one of the problems that Euclid, Euclid's geometry and that uh, students learn to work with, which is how do you divide up a line into equal portions? And this gets really fine and precise, um, and this is at the heart of a lot of the precision of enlightenment science is getting exact scale. So it's one thing to divide a line into 10 or 12 inches, right? But how about getting down into fractions? Can you get to 100th of an inch? How about 1,000th of an inch? Because that's what you're going to need to get some of the astronomically precise readings to prove the kind of Copernican system. You're going to need to divide the scale on a quadrant into one thousandth of an inch um, and to be able to read that. And how do you do that? And again, it actually comes down to the precision of these kinds of devices. Because not only is it, you know, until the 1790s when they invent an engine, every scale is done by human hand. Um, every workman would, would learn to, and every child would learn to make their own ruler. They'd learn to make their own protractor. They'd learn to make all of these kinds of things. Um, and then I won't go into a ton of detail today, but actually reading them, like almost every measurement in the 18th century, this is something you would never see, but they're almost always done with protractors. Like even astronomers, when they're reading a device, they're often just putting their protractor up to it and 
And these protractors often have very uh, fine adjustment wheels, and so they're getting it to within a hair's breadth of what it is and applying it to these kinds of scales. So um, here's another example of uh, Washington um, drawing an elaborate uh, compass um, here. This is why the magnetic compass has its term compass, is because it has a special compass card kind of created for it to read. But again, these are all created by hand, and these are the things that children um, would learn to do, and they'd learn the principles of geometry, of measuring, things like that. But in a way that you can imagine that this could kind of draw children into the world and make it interesting to them in a way that, again, tedious rote calculation would not, right? Like if that is the basis of mathematics, there's probably not a lot of people interested in it. And we can start to understand why people like Emile de Chatelet or even Washington himself. I don't think Washington, I, I kind of don't believe, this is my enlightenment side, I don't believe in innate genius or innate talents per se. I think that, you know, kind of like Locke said, we're all born as a tabula rasa, like a blank slate, and we cultivate them. And I think someone like Washington ended up doing well in mathematics, not because it was a talent of his, but because he learned and was engaged and excited to build this whole foundation of kind of geometry um, in the head. So even as I'm talking about this, there's the danger of this getting really tedious quick, right? Talking about drawing with math. So let me try to show a video. Um, I thought about bringing a camera um, because I, like George Washington, have been learning to use a ruler and compass. So I have a modern day reprint of a manual that's the kind that Washington would use that has you work through all the problems of geometry. So I thought I would, get a camera and show you me working through it, but then I thought that's gonna be a technical disaster and I'll probably make lots of mistakes. So let me just show a video here of someone constructing a simple thing, a star. How do you make an accurately geometric five-sided star? So let's just look, hopefully this will work here, quickly at someone and maybe you'll get a sense of this, what it was like to work with the tool. It's gonna get interesting in a second, I promise. <laughs> but you gotta start with the basics. You gotta divide that circle, gotta find the center, gotta divide the circle into quadrants. And as I've been working through this, I'm reminded, any of you that do musical instruments or other things know what it's like to slowly train, to have to learn your fingers, to play scales and things like that. And the joy that comes as you get better at it or if you do crafts, sewing, things like that. The kind of pleasure, the kinesthetic pleasure of learning to wield a tool and create wonderful things um, is not to be discounted. So now this individual has identified the five points and so they've switched to the kind of red ink and are gonna draw this 
five-sided star. So there we have what is a, you know, it's a fun process to watch. And like I said, it, it, like someone playing an instrument, there's like a series of kind of steps that you have to learn to do this. But it gets really complicated and really interesting fast. Like this is kind of the, yeah, the entry level things. And then I'll kind of show what you can do more. But yes, first question, yeah. Is, is that the only way to make that star? That compass. So, no, there are other ways. Like, there are different techniques. I mean, it's, it's the only way to make a star. It's like this one with different angles, but there are multiple techniques. People become famous like mathematical proofs. So, like, I discovered a new way of doing this. So, there are multiple ways that you can get there. This is one, the more simple one. Okay. And, um, oh, I had another question. I'll think of it. And then okay, well, yeah, just raise your hand. Oh, okay. you didn't say anything? Um, yeah. Sure, I'll use the mic. So there are multiple ways um, to develop, to, to make a star. Um, and I was suggesting that kind of like creating a mathematical proof or an equation, people become kind of noted for developing a particular technique that's either easier or more interesting or more complex. And OK, I'll come back to you. And the other thing is, is this takes abstract ideas like what is the relationship between these geometric figures and what is geometry about? Like if you just try to memorize scoliums and axioms, doesn't make a lot of sense. Like you understand it when you understand the relationship between the different forms and can like notes that you can put together on a scale and play music, you kind of understand that relationship. So say you're left-handed. <laughs> do you do it backwards or do it a different way because you're left-handed? I think that's a great question about being left-handed. I don't know. There are I mean the, yeah. I I am interested in um Handedness, uh, and in the 18th century, you know, the 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 root word for left-handed is sinister. Like, uh, and there's a sense in which you know there is a more otherwise. So people are kind of there's a moral idea that right-handedness is better, and people are kind of trained to use their right hand. Although more in the 19th century, but um, there must have been left-handed people. I don't know. That's a great question. Like, or the question about what about people with different dexterity. So I'm kind of presuming people that are very nimble with fingers or learn to be nimble, much like an instrument, right? Like it's a pianist has different control of their fingers after five years of playing than when they started. Um, but I don't, you know, but there's certainly a lot of people that were missing hands or had hands destroyed by accidents or something like that. So, but the left-handed thing, I don't quite know. I do know that there were a couple machines in volometers and stuff like that that created certain special shapes that only could be used one way. They couldn't be used like as a mirror image, but it's a good, yeah, good question. Um, so, um, which brings me to this kind of point um, uh, about, you know, so we saw like the, yes. Oh, fine, okay, five minutes, yeah. So. Learning to make these kind of shapes and learning to understand rules about proportion and relationships and how you can use certain kinds of chords and arcs to create and construct um, items. And, and originally when I asked the question about is there only one way to create it, I was thinking like, yes, there is only one way to create you know, most shapes in this world um, in the 18th century, which is through a compass and rule. Um, and an example that, and I've talked about typography, I won't go on about this long, but if you want to create the letters, like for typographers to make, you'll see here that creating like this Garamond G requires, it's constructed like that triangle through a series of mathematical maneuvers. So there's no reason when you read a letter printed in the 18th century that you would think it had anything to do with a compass or Euclid or geometry, but in fact, it did, and the people who read that would have understood it, and they would have praised type and appreciated someone like Baskerville because they, as children, spend time making capital letters. Um, 
and appreciating the kind of geometry behind it. Um, the same thing with classical architecture. The 18th century was a f an age that was in love with neoclassical architecture. And we can say, and I do in lectures, that's because they praised harmony and order and proportions and the kind of geometric logic, and that's all true. But I don't think it means the same thing if you don't know that people spent their formative years wielding compasses and rulers, practicing exactly those principles and understanding the relationship and how to construct it. And so I just give one example that's my personal favorite, which is the involute, which is the swirls that you see on iconic order columns, right? Like, I have a house that had, had involute columns, and I looked at them, and I didn't think one thing about them. But now I've tried to draw involutes, which are this really complicated spiral that involves the golden ratio. And I can totally see why people who looked at those columns would see them in fundamentally different ways than I would as someone who didn't do that. So that's kind of one of my main themes I think I wanted to kind of emphasize is about this bodily and kind of intellectual and character shaping exercise of what it was like to wield these tools um, to kind of make everything. And another example, I, I joked about how the 18th century is famous for furniture, but let's go there. Chippendale, Thomas Chippendale and his style of furniture that um, kind of defined 18th century Britain, right? Um, before the furniture became even popular, there was the director's, the cabin make, gentleman and cabinet maker's directory. But um, Chippendale, like any craftsman, knew that to create those items, he had to literally create them on paper with geometric tools and kind of figure out their portions and ratios. And so the catalog is filled with all these what look like blueprints of the different items and that reveal the, the, again, the ratios and connections that underlie um, all of these things. So anything that was in the built world could be probably looked through through this lens of kind of basic geometry um, and the shaping of things and that people would have appreciated the same way that those of you that are avid quilters will look at a quilt and see it differently than I who have never made a quilt, right? Like you know and can appreciate um, the choices made and, the, and why it is such a great piece. Or again, to take the music example, although maybe I'm beating that too much, but um, musicians can listen to a piece of music and understand it and appreciate it differently. Um, and I will point out that actually all music also wielded uh, compasses because at the heart of all the study of music, in fact, in the 18th century, it's called canonics which is dividing the line, kind of like Pythagoras. You would imagine a line like a string, and you use the compass to reveal what the different notes are and how they are proportions of the string. Like a three, three to four ratio is like the A on a G chord, and therefore, that, that's wrong, but you get my idea kind of, right? Like everything in this world can be turned into lines and, and, and is begun study with a kind of compass. Um, and I mentioned like on the bottom end of the social spectrum that ordinary craftspeople, indentured servants, and slave people would have learned to use these tools because they were central to making things. You know, George Washington's slaves, in fact, they found compasses buried that were from the workshops of his blacksmiths, his woodworkers, things like that. But up on the upper end of the spectrum, um, especially now that uh, Queen Elizabeth's passing, we've been thinking and watching a lot about the, the monarchy, it's really fascinating that George III begins his education just like George Washington with a set of compasses and doing uh, elementary Euclid and learning it. Um, and his instructor, uh, the Earl of Butte, um, put a huge emphasis on that, that unlike the kind of pampered monarchs, he wouldn't say this to his father, but unlike the previous Georges and Charleses that had spent their time aristocratically hunting and kind of you know foppishly learning um, the arts of court, George III was gonna become the paragon of rationalism and virtue, and he was gonna do that by learning mathematics and mechanics at the beginning, um, not Latin and things like that. And so we'll just look very briefly at George III's copybooks. So these are the monarchs when he was just about the age of George Washington, I think he was 15 years old um, here. Uh, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but he's um, doing similar kinds of exercises. My favorite one is this. Uh, he really liked ellipses, which are really hard to construct. And again, I, when I, now I see an elliptical window in an 18th century home, I look at it different. But it was one of these fascinating shapes like the involute. It's very hard to construct an, an ellipse, and this was this one. And I don't know what he meant by tis too true at the top there. Who knows? Um, all right, so uh, very briefly, you know, and let's see, time-wise. Um, so surveying, obviously, a big part uh, is using the compass, 
to take readings and convert the kind of messy world outside into clean lines on paper that can be studied. Um, how do you calculate the area of one of these kind of unusual shapes? You don't use a ruler, you use a compass. You come over and measure the distances like this and then you take it over to a calculating device. And uh, people didn't like tedious calculations in the 18th century. There's a little bit of that here, but in general, I'll kind of mention almost all measuring was done with a compass. You measure what you want in the, in the paper world, even in the real world. How do you know how tall a building is, right? You take a compass like, like this and I kind of, were any of you kids that you would like put someone's head between your fingers and kind of, or something in squish, you know? They would do the kind of same thing with compasses. There's almost nothing you can't do with a compass. They would learn to, at different paces, measure how tall something was and then convert that over. Um, here's some more kind of images. Um, I'm gonna stop in just one second, but lastly, I did, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I did wanna um, say something too about when I was w watching Washington's page and the theme of the day is kind of thinking about how people actually did things, not like ideas, but like how do they learn math? They learned it through these tools. I was struck by how he and other people um, that I encountered, uh, this, here's Washington's book, how much they focused on kind of penmanship and presentation. So you see the kind of the flourishes here. I think it's really important whenever you're like studying the past just to like be absorbed by something. Like, Why would they do that? What, what's behind that? And uh, you know, there's a, the world of penmanship and calligraphy and the way in which the pen is used to express, the, the, there's a lot there. Um, I was gonna show an example from William Kilnick, another book I've looked at, um, an example of here. He's talking about the, sci the math of reduction, but notice that he like, draws this kind of impressive, flourished bird on it or whatnot, but it's not that different than the math there. It's learning to like on the page design things, right? Like how to create in fact, one of the things I want you to think about is the compass is the most generative tool. It's the tool you use to create stars, to create any shapes, like to kind of design and stuff like that. And the same thing is going on with um, kind of penmanship uh, and whatnot here. All right, let's stop here. Uh, and in fact, I've gone a little bit over, um, and we'll come back and Not to worry. move on. Yeah, I'm glad as a quilter that now I just buy a plastic triangle and <laughs> draw around it. In two minutes, we're gonna try this quickly. Um, so there are a lot of examples uh, that we could keep going on, but we've probably gone a lot. I did wanna show another really important 18th century art that comes out of this compass work, which is, and, and there's all these older terms like ooliging, or this one is dialing. Like dialing is a specific branch of mathematics that uses geometry to create sundials. Um, and, and you know, the 18th century was the great age of all of these wonderfully complex and beautiful kind of sundials with these hyperbolic curves that trace the different kind of seasons um, and whatnot. So um, even though the clock would also be a great kind of thing to imagine as an instrument to explore the enlightenment, like every mechanical clock had to be set constantly by sun time and by local mean time. So everyone had to have sundials to be able to kind of set their clocks. And so we could go on, you know, Navigation obviously uses these instruments, um, you know, kind of every field. I wanted to just to show a couple, um, you know, here's Washington's case again, and these were ubiquitous um, throughout the 18th century. These uh, pocket cases that were kind of affordable collections of these kind of drafting tools that with children would start with using, and then it would move on to all the kind of advanced professions of life, whether it's architecture, surveying, military, things like that. Um, and then one of the things I was mentioning was about calculation. So you'll notice there's these really kind of complicated looking um, devices. Like this looks a little bit more than just a normal ruler and whatnot. Um, there's this different kind of devices that are sectors or different kinds of scales. Um, these are basically 18th century version of slide rules. So they have all kinds of specialized logarithmic scales so that if you're a forester or a navigator, Rather, when you take a measurement off a chart or any kind of piece of calculation, rather than converting it to numbers and doing a lot of advanced addition, subtraction, multiplication, you just take those readings and put them right over to that logarithmic scale. And again, back to this idea that you just become really good at like flipping your thing. You, you add numbers and therefore do complex multiplication by kind of whirling around your compass. Um, so much so that they 
started embedding little brass tips at the beginning of scales so that you wouldn't destroy the compass, I mean, the, the ruler, because you were, con and also get a more accurate footing, because we're getting down into people being able to do calculations that on paper might take 20 minutes, can be done like in 20 seconds, um, with greater accuracy and reliability if you have the right kind of tools um, here. Uh, and so astronomical tables, navigation, all this stuff, people didn't do all the kind of long paperwork. They wielded compasses and did all this kind of calculation. So, um, and then lastly, just kind of, I just wanted to say that the compass became like an icon also of like order and virtue and living like a rational life. Like these were famous prints of the 18th century, like keep within the compass. They're kind of like Hogarth's prints about the rake's progress or whatnot. It's about, on the outside is if you don't stay within the kind of compass, um, you'll have disaster if you do gambling or visit brothels, things like that. Um, and so, and we've lost the meaning of compass, but the word compass, it appears like in the King James Bible all the time as a verb, like such and such compassed this action against, like, I just wanted to kind of emphasize that in the 18th century and, and well into the 19th century, um, the, you know, here's a set of teapots with the same kind of thing. The compass was the way that you, out of chaos, create order. It's like I said, the, the way you generate all the forms. It's the way you generate order, rules, logic, proportion. Um, and then so I wanted to finish with the last thing. William Blake is kind of two-sided on the compass. We saw, we started with Newton's the view of Newton as a cold rationalist who ignores the real beautiful world and instead just wants to draw with his compass on paper. This is William Blake's print done at the same time called The Ancient of Days, which comes from this line that he loved in the book of Proverbs. And this is one of his favorite prints uh, where, and the person that's being referred to here, when he prepared the heavens, I was there, is wisdom itself. And it says, not as an idle spectator, but as a coworker with my father, when he set a compass upon the face of the deep. Um, so this is a sense, and this is the visual imagery, that God himself created the world with a compass, like in the Bible, kind of, again, creating, generating order and meaning. So, so it's a very powerful tool, um, and I've talked a lot about it, so let's move on. Um, so item two for our world of enlightenment here, kind of, the electrostatic generator. So I want to show a kind of different side of science, a little bit from the side that we were looking at about kind of geometry and reason and learning to think. Um, analytically on paper and design, and instead kind of explore the world of curiosity and experimentation um, in the kind of enlightenment. Um, and also to talk about the way they discovered new things. The compass did exist in previous eras. It becomes really important in the 18th century, but electricity was pretty much a brand new phenomenon that was studied and was generated artificially through this kind of device. So here we have, um, this was belonged to an English showman um, and scientific lecturer that came to the colonial America came to colonial America in the mid 18th century, and then ended up selling it to Benjamin Franklin um, to conduct his experiments on electricity. Um, it started off um, at the beginning of the century with a lecturer called Frank uh, Francis Hawksby, who invented this basic device, which is um, turning a really large wheel there to get a lot of leverage um, to spin a glass. Um, globe that has a vacuum in it, um, and then to have that rub against um, a hand if you want to generate electricity onto a person. So if you want to like electrostatically charge a person. Or it could be put into batteries to be kept or discharged, often through a, a, a point on the device that lets you discharge it. So just think of this as a way to generate Static, the way that if you walk, uh, you know, on carpet and rub your feet, you know, your body kind of charges up and the tinsel on the Christmas tree kind of gravitates towards you, right? This is a, a device designed um, to create that in kind of larger quantities. Um, and I wanted to kind of emphasize this theme about how people use these kinds of devices. And there's so many of them. We saw the orrery, but there's air pumps, there's barometers, there's microscopes. The 18th century enlightenment wouldn't be what it was if it wasn't for these devices of kind of wonder and observation and curiosity that let you play with the world and kind of interrogate it, observe it. Um, but I definitely want to emphasize the playful side um, of it. Electricity was fun, and that's what made people drawn to it. Maybe that's a theme with the compass too, right? People are drawn and are passionate about things that engage them, um, and the enlightenment was full of that. So one of the things that was done was these experiments used people's bodies and thought of all these clever ways to kind of explore electricity, which is this invisible fluid, maybe? What is it? They called it the electrical fire. 
seem to be kind of a force throughout nature, but again, the ancients didn't know how to harness it or channel it. Um, here's an experiment where a boy is hung on silk threads and is electrostatically charged, right? So he's kind of charged up, and then by putting his hand over a plate of chaff, it rises up to meet him here, right? So like somehow he's able um, you know, to float in air and to lift things up. Um, here's another example where someone is lifting up the hair uh, of an individual. We started with that tableau of the orrery. I, I mean, I do want to emphasize that the Enlightenment, contrary to William Blake's portrait of Newton, was a very social affair. People liked to do things together as groups and kind of observe together in groups and, again, be playful um, with things. And electricity uh, was one of the, it, it really was the most kind of popular spectacle of the 18th century until the balloon that I started with. Like electricity drew crowds of people. And here we see another kind of one of these large generators. And here this person is kind of rubbing it in order to make sure to generate the electricity and then kind of conducting it through that um, boy. They developed uh, new batteries, these Volta batteries and Leiden jars and things like that that allowed them. So this is a diagram of, of what a, a traveling lecturer would, um, and I don't know if I should use lecturer or showman because it was kind of a mixture of both. It was kind of a dividing line. So all throughout Britain um, in the 18th century, you would see at coffee shops, at assembly rooms, at churches, would often open their doors to have these kind of scientific lectures, which were so um, well received because they were both entertaining but edifying. Like the 18th century was trying to move away. I should probably show a Hogarth print of kind of the body plebeian culture of heavy drinking, you know, um, sometimes kind of blood sports with animals, gambling, like all the things that could, you know, that and that compass diagram that you want to stay away from. All those kinds of entertainments that lure you. Um, to not the better parts of yourself, right? So the Enlightenment was very much about trying to think of how to make uh, education entertaining um, to groups. And so they developed kind of all these devices. Um, and showmen had batteries of different experiments um, to, you know, to do with electricity. But they do the same thing with the air pump, which created a vacuum. And you could actually watch, you know, people say a penny and a coin will fall. I'm mean, sorry, a feather and a coin will fall at the same um, time if there's not air pressure. But how would you ever know that, right? Well, they build air pumps that create vacuums and they drop them in there. They extinguish things in the vacuum. They ask, if a bell rings in a vacuum, will it make a noise? Come see my de de demonstration, right? I'll have the vacuum to prove it. And they think of clever things like the Magdalene sphere, which are these two spheres that are sucked together by a vacuum. Um, and they're so powerfully joined just by the vacuum. There's no other connecting that they would hook up teams of eight horses on either side and have them pull as hard as they could to try to break the sphere. Not a lot of science there, but a lot of entertainment, right? Uh, but it may be that entree into you studying about pneumatics and about vacuums and whatnot. So, so the 18th century was very much um, of that piece. And uh, here is one more. Um, this may be my favorite. This is someone who lights uh, alcohol on fire by having an electrical charge come through him, through the sword, and then kind of like flambe, just kind of explode. But they're also discovering a lot of interesting things about what are conductors and what are insulators, like what, are the, what is the nature of these kinds of charges uh, and whatnot. Um, we'll move beyond that. So here's an, uh, another really interesting example of kind of one of the larger demonstrations. This one's done kind of in a dissecting hall here. So it's even bigger than some of these other things, but we have you know, one of these kind of um, electrical experiments here. Um, I'm going to talk in a second about the actual kind of science that comes out of that. But, um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of remind us about uh, how people would have experienced science. It wasn't always just a solitary pursuit, but instead would have been in groups, would have been entertaining. Um, there was a dividing line that was a little bit blurry between what was entertaining and what was just quackery. I'm going to show an image next, uh, a cartoon. And the 18th century is the great age of satirical cartoons. So we'll have to look at some um, at different times. But uh, this is playing off of uh, there's a doctor um, in 18th century England who a lot of this electricity is experimented with medically. like or in any different way. Like, what happens if you inject electricity into plants? Will they grow more? 
So they create like electrified gardens. Like, will electricity cure consumption or different diseases and things like that? So there's um, lots of experimentation, um, and the Enlightenment's always interested in Enlightenment figures in applying knowledge to kind of the everyday world. But like I said, sometimes the line goes a little too far, and so there's a particular Dr. Graham who in Pell-Mell sets up a, a fancy establishment that has what he calls the celestial bed, um, and it's a bed that's electrified, and he guarantees that couples will be able to conceive children if they're in his like kind of special electrified bed, and so this cartoon kind of um, the quacks um, gets at this kind of world of, again, like where is the dividing line between kind of just pure spectacle um, and and what is the and what is reasonable experimentation and curiosity like one of the things that uh, is unleashed let's move on to a different uh, image one of the things that's unleashed in the 18th century is a total reevaluation of curiosity um, and it's so easy for me as an 18th century person to always pick on the Middle Ages and be like in the Middle Ages curiosity was looked down upon along with reading and everything else you know or whatever that's not true but there is a sense in which curiosity was always um, problematic. In fact, people of the book know that you know it's the fruit of the tree of knowledge, wanting to know things and wanting to not accept your place that leads to our ejection from the Garden of Eden. And there's just always a sense that curiosity is kind of a dangerous thing too, wanting to know what you don't know or shouldn't know about or cannot know about. But the 18th century really kind of, in some ways, jettisons that. And, and in fact, the term, what do we call Enlightenment people in 18th century Britain? They don't go by philosoph which is the term in France, the philosophes. Um, instead, they go by either the literati or the virtuoso, like people who are kind of virtuous, or my favorite term, the curioso, the people who are curious, right? Like the people who will sit and observe plants and then observe stars and things like that. So, um, which brings me to uh, Ben Franklin. We kind of started with that globe that he purchased from a traveling salesperson. Um, to conduct experiments. He conducted them in groups with his friends, like doing these kinds of experiments. And again, I want to kind of emphasize the sociability that's at the heart of this science. His text that he wrote, um, Experiments and Observations on Electricity, is I think such a representative example of science in the 18th century because it's all through letters. It's an epistolary text. And when I read it in class, a lot of times students are like, I just want to translate this into what the science is. Like, why didn't he write a report? where he just told me, like, this is my theory. Because I should say that, um, I'm kind of presuming, but I shouldn't, that you may know that Franklin kind of develops really important insights and ideas, and in fact, develops the whole language of charged, positive, negative. He kind of develops the framework for electricity to be a science. Um, and it advances quite rapidly, and I said it wasn't a science beforehand. Um, but he does it through these groups, through a network of correspondence, writing to people in England, in France, kind of back and forth, conversation. And, and here's what's really important. He sets a model for a new form of humility, not the kind of William Blake image of the rational, cold geometrician who kind of deductively argues points, insists on them. Instead, Franklin, as you see him here, wearing his little kind of beaver skin hat, and he's got his glasses, and he's writing letters. He's he puts on this really intentional persona of someone who's just curious and open to ideas. He doesn't build theories, or in the language of the 18th century, he's not a system builder, or my favorite, a system monger. Like, they don't like people who insist on, here are all the organized principles, like, here's the logic. If you argue with me, you're wrong. They're seen as being, like, not the appropriate. You need a particular kind of moral temperament to do science in the British Enlightenment. And Franklin's book becomes a model for that. People read this and are just like, I want to be just like Franklin. I want to be you know, open, pragmatic, work with people, um, do that kind of science. He ends up winning the Copley Medal, which is kind of like a Nobel Prize. The 18th Century Royal Society awards this to the person who does the most advances um, in science. Um, and for colonists to win that, this kind of backcountry person um, is seen uh, as you know, quite unusual. I, let me, my slide's a little out of order. Let me show an image just to kind of put a face on that change. Um, here's a portrait of Franklin that I doubt many of you will have seen. This almost never appears. This is a portrait by Robert Feek of Franklin um, in 1740-something. Um, 
historians don't have to know dates. Um, and it's when Franklin retires from his printing business because um, he has enough money and he wants to set himself up as a gentleman in kind of 18th century fashion. Um, and it seems so, un so unlike our image of Franklin, you know, kind of stiff, you know, the kind of highly curled hair, the forced, contrived pose, um, the kind of super lacy cuffs that are like, look at me, I don't have to work. Like I have, and, and I say that because in the 18th century, like cuffs really are, they're not quite as elaborate as in the 17th century, but they're a sign that you don't do manual labor. Like really elaborate things over your hands are, are meant um, to show that. Um, and then later on we saw that, you know, that image of him before where he's wearing spectacles, he's wearing like a, a beaver skin hat, you know. Um, this one he's dressed a little bit more kind of as a middle class person, but you see him kind of, um, you know, just a very different kind of face. Um, and that's something that was important um, to, let me think about how I put this. To play in the world of the Enlightenment, you had to learn to play certain roles, right? Um, to adopt certain personas. Um, and so part of learning to kind of enter in this world was learning to how to act kind of humble and how to act sociably um, and how to couch your ideas, how to work together, and even how to present yourself. So there's a kind of a big change from the idea that um, the gentleman philosopher who kind of stands above everything to just kind of humble coworker, you know, in the vineyard of science um, that are all going to kind of work together. And so Franklin and some other people, Joseph Priestley, there's a lot of these in the, like names in the 18th century. They set the stage and teach the next generation like how to behave in the world of science. And I think that's important. I think like almost every kind of field you learn, like even in today's world, if you're going to become a chemist or geologist or teacher, you carefully learn to script yourself, like how you behave, how you dress, how you appear um, in a group. And there's a lot to be done with that um, in the 18th century world. Um, so another thing that's interesting about electricity, so we've talked a little bit about like kind of the culture of curiosity and wanting to observe things, talked a little bit about the kind of new social model of what an open, curious, flexible, genial scientist is supposed to be like um, in the 18th century. Um, and I think a third thing to emphasize that we can look at through this world of electricity um, is themes about kind of utility, as I was kind of starting to suggest about in the 18th century, there was a sense that, that it wasn't enough to just explore and be curious and learn, but you should also apply it to useful kind of skills in society, or, or useful knowledge is, becomes the, the kind of buzzword of the 18th century. Um, and Franklin, we have here like two images of uh, a model that Franklin used to use, both for experimentation, but also for, and others picked it up for the kind of the showmanry aspect, which is um, a, a house that has the lightning rods that he kind of developed. So out of this idea of electricity, um, which everyone is excited about, but people aren't sure how it's going to be used. I mentioned there's medical attempts, agricultural attempts to experiment. But the one that becomes most important is the attempt to equate lightning and thunder in the world, or lightning, um, with electricity, with the kind of electrical fluid. And to use all those little playful experiments of like putting points to like light up alcohol or using a point to kind of shock someone, you know, things like that. It actually becomes a kind of a an idea that it could be used to tame lightning itself. Like what if you were to use a point and put it on top of a building um, like we were playing with in those experiments to draw electricity um, so that it would go into, you know, to hit the point and then come down through a metal wire to the ground. And instead of destroying the building or catching it on fire, it would protect it from lightning. So I just want to emphasize what an impact this had on 18th century views of science, of enlightenment, and of the world. Because nothing better exemplifies God's righteous anger um, and the power of nature over people than lightning, right? Um, in fact, there's a famous uh, quote that Turgot kind of said about Franklin, that he stole lightning from the gods and took the scepter from tyrants. Sorry, I'm trying to remember the quote. But it was this kind of that this parallel idea that like dethroning arbitrary power in politics through kind of revolutions to create republics and rights follows from this original bold kind of Promethean like move, which is to like take something that everyone had been afraid of and to show no, it's not what you think it is. It actually follows rational principles 
and we have simple solutions to follow, you know, to harness them and to protect people. Um, I'll talk on our third section uh, session about um, vaccination because it's something we're thinking about. In the 18th century, this is one of the things they developed the first vaccines, in their case for smallpox. So I'll talk a little bit about medicine and, and we'll look at a lancet and kind of talk about that. But, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of emphasize how big of a controversy, I mean, how, how much of an impact that made on people. Um, so it starts with experimenting with models showing that you can throw huge electric charge at a model and not make it catch on fire or blow up. Vice versa, they did like to blow up things too. They would like, you know, take a church, like a wooden church model, and then like run a huge current of electricity and just watch it blow up. And then they do the same thing with one of these lightning rods and it would just go down right through the wire here. So, so again, it's an example of how really big ideas about how the world works, what's the power of human reason, of human intervention in the world, can kind of come through everyday tools, experiments, like this is how people's minds are changed and how their visions of the world are formed is through these particular kind of dramatic examples, more so than necessarily reading a text. Although I'm not against reading, I love ideas, I read books all the time, I am an intellectual historian in many ways, but I do think we have to put ourselves in these kinds of rooms and imagine what that was like. And here we have one of the lightning rods that's at the Franklin Institute of one from a church that they're not reusable sometimes once they're uh, hit here. Um, but it is interesting that Franklin, the great deist of the 18th century, you know, so I can't remember, I've, the Turgot quote, there's another quote about how Franklin was like the atheist who saved more churches than any person in, in history because churches with their high steeples were constantly hit. You'd think that would be an irony for the idea that God was punishing people, that he seemed to always go after churches, but I guess when there's different denominations that can be used to, to good effect. Um, but so this becomes, you know, again, and we'll, I'll show in another couple examples, but people don't necessarily know how these things will be useful when they're exploring it. They're just curious, but they are hoping and often pushing themselves to find utility. Um, I also think it's maybe worth noting, um, I didn't put this slide in, but there's also not everyone in science agrees, and you'll be shocked to know that science can be politicized in the 18th century just like today. Um, and that's also worth remembering because I can sometimes portray the Enlightenment um, a little too cozy, a little too much everyone agreeing. So this model, if you look at it carefully, um, there are two lightning rods at the top. There's one with a point and one with a ball here. Um, and it goes to a kind of a debate that happened in the 18th century. And this could, again, either be an experimental model or showmanship. Franklin argued that points were better. It drew the lightning and then carried it down to the um, ground. There were some other British scientists who thought that a ball, a ball was better because a ball would not attract the lightning. Why do you want to attract lightning to you? Like a ball would keep lightning away, but if it came, it would grab it in the case or whatever. So there was this just kind of different view. In fact, there were kind of, you know, people argued that Franklin was going to create more problems by, by putting these pointed rods. And so there was lots of experimentation. And I don't have the slide here. Oh, no, I do have the slide, sorry. Um, of a giant experiment done in the Pantheon in London to test whether the ball or the point was a better one. Anyway, it became political because George III intervened and said it's gotta be a ball. And the fact that Franklin, who was part of these rebellious colonies, argued that it was a point. So it became a highly politicized kind of issue between British and American scientists, between Republicans, small r, and monarchists. And so it kind of um, went back and forth. Um, and then to this day, I'll still see like ball, <laughs> Uh, um, lightning rods on some British old um, institutions. Not because they want them to use, they probably have a more modern working one, but they were installed like in the 18th century. Um, so, there, so anyway, there, there was definitely um, disputes uh, in the world of science. But again, they often took place through these worlds of public experiments, public spectacle where people uh, could see them. And then the last thing, and then I'll move on to the final item, um, just about wanting to explore, uh, you know, people were like, okay, we can run electricity, that's great. What happens when you get even more electricity? So this is one of the biggest, it's like the super collider of the 18th century, um, that uh, a scientist, uh, Martin Van Marum, who was at the Royal Society, had built. So it's a giant piece of glass, I can't remember if it's like 15 feet or 20 feet, that gets cranked up to create a really big charge to do kind of more, and they don't even know what they're gonna do with it, but they're just like, let's start zapping things and seeing what happens. Um, and some of the things are, were strange and didn't go anywhere, but I wanted to say the thing that I am most fascinated by with um, 
with Marham's experiments is they discovered that you could blow up small pieces of wire. So this is an image, and you could capture it on paper. So they would take this supercharger, and this is a piece of lead and tin wire, um, and they ran it through, and the, the wire just exploded in this weird, gaseous way um, that people thought was amazing. And most of these experiments were done in the dark, I should point out. So it added to the theatricality and the ability to see it. And so he figured out with a friend that you know you can wrap this in paper in the right way. And so this is an actual impression of it, what happened when a, 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 um, a lead and tin wire exploded, right? So this is like an 18th century, almost like a film, you know, kind of capturing that moment um, here. And they did it with all these different things, and they weren't quite sure what could be done. People didn't know what to be done with this. But in the 1960s and 70s, when plasma physics took off as a field, they actually went back to these experiments um, and kind of realized that they were on to really important things about plasma states and whatnot. So point just being is like the Enlightenment, the Curioso were always interested in kind of experimenting, recording material, kind of interested in the spectacle of it. Sometimes it led to very useful things. Other times um, it didn't seem useful, either because it was dead end or it would be later on. Um, and we still go back to the 18th century for many of our most important records on meteorology, on just you know um, natural uh, collections of insects, minerals, experiments, things like that. Um, which brings me to my third item, and I'll be uh, quicker here. Um, what do you do with all this information in the Enlightenment? And so I wanted to focus on, I like to think of it as a technology, uh, paper technology of the commonplace book. And so I have here Mary Smith's commonplace book, which is at the Dibner Library. And it's one of my favorite documents of the 18th century. Um, if you are not familiar with the commonplace book, they exist a little bit before the 18th century, or, um, but they, become, they come into their flowering kind of in the 18th century, which is a book in, where you're supposed to record excerpts, quotes, or useful information from your reading. And you organize them either conceptually by heading or alphabetically. So it's a way to kind of process information, both in terms of recording what you're reading, um, but also, like I said, kind of um, intellectually think through, make connections, to be able to put on the same place, in a common place, different ideas. And it builds on a whole fascinating world that I don't have time to talk about, but of thinking about how to organize m knowledge in ways that involve the body and the mind. Um, some of you may have heard of like the tradition of memory castles, that people would memorize information by creating an elaborate castle or structure in their mind. And every piece of information would be imagined to be put in a different room and a shelf. And the way that you would remember things is you would walk around inside your castle and put them and go into them. This is at the heart of classical rhetoric. Like when you talk about like the word topic, like a topic of a talk is the topos, the place. And Cicero would have told someone like me that I would memorize my talk and I would imagine myself walking around the room. Like topic one, I come here. Topic two, I come here. Topic three. Notice how the body is involved in that, like you're kind of kinetically or haptically storing knowledge so that you can kind of in your mind find it. And this is one of the concerns with people with reading digitally as opposed to reading with a physical text. Like neuro neuroscientists will tell you that flipping the page uh, is a very important act and that you remember and process information by where you see it on a page. And that if you scroll, if it's one whole big text, your mind has physical and mental problems with absorbing it because it doesn't have those kind of markers and registers. So anyway, so I wanted to just say that, so this is a problem kind of throughout, or not problem, but an issue that humans deal with whenever they deal with information and knowledge. But the 18th century created so much of it. There was just a vast explosion of printed material, of specimens, of you know things like that, kind of the image of the, you know, the tin alloy. There's just so much collection of data, material, specimens, and things. So people struggled, like kind of information overload. What do we do with all this? And so there were a lot of different techniques, but one of them I think that's really important and fascinating is to look at kind of commonplace books and to see um, here we have, um, I, I flipped to the page where Cause of Thunder, right? So here Mary Smith is kind of recording down what she has read about why thunder occurs and would be adding to it from different pieces as she reads different magazines, different articles, reads the proceedings of the Royal Society and whatnot. Um, this was kept from the 1760s to the 1780s. Um, just because we were talking about compasses, I thought I'd show an image of her 
kind of also working through geometrical things, and here's a page about dialing and whatnot. Um, you could buy increasingly commonplace books that would come with indexes, and you would be indexing your information kind of to record it. But I think it's really fascinating that most people made their own commonplace book. You know, I, I invoked Locke's idea of the tabula rasa, the blank slate. Like, I think that metaphor really struck people because they literally created their blank slates all the time. When George Washington created that copy book for his geometry, he didn't buy a book. He, he wove together the pieces of paper and created it. And the same with most of these commonplace books. People would have bought the paper, they would have folded it, they would have cut it, they would have bound it the way they wanted to. It was their little paper world that they were creating. Um, and I didn't get a good picture of it, but Mary Smith carved little notches in the side with the alphabet. If you remember like the old dictionaries that would allow you to flip to pages, right? Like she literally did that with hers. Other people used really elaborate um, uh, bookmarks that had hundreds of pieces of string with different colors, you know, like almost like today's colored tabs or if you read on a certain scripture. Um, here's another wonderful. So the commonplace books are just an amazing window into how people sorted information, but again, thought about it, because what becomes meaningful is when you can put different ideas together and start to think in different ways. But again, it's a very material process. It's not simply about the realm of ideas, it's about what tools do you have um, to do that. Um, and of course, there's also physical aspects. I love, there's a whole genre of uh, 18th century paintings about the letter racks. Um, this is how people used to organize stuff. They used to tack it up on the walls with these kind of elastic kind of items here, <laughs> like to kind of sort their information. I don't have a bulletin board in my new office and I'm really missing that, like being able to kind of store it. But this works when you have like limited amounts, you know, a handful of letters. What if you're Linnaeus and you're receiving like 5,000 letters, you know, a year, or you're one of these people like Mary Smith who can now read hundreds of books a year through subscription libraries and things. And so we see elaborate new furniture created. This is like the kind of physical version of a commonplace with uh, tags and strips, um, these kind of note, you know, kind of like, uh, like a card catalog, right, where you can start to kind of file things. And so I'm really interested in all of these little tools that people in the Enlightenment start to develop and use, often highly personalized to like kind of sort information. Um, and the scholars that look at, that study this with important figures, and I'll end on this kind of note, um, we'll talk about how this stuff often can shape really important ideas as well. So I mentioned Linnaeus. Linnaeus was overwhelmed with all the new plants and animals, and he developed his own card structuring system uh, to record all this thing. And the scholars that study Linnaeus, and what's really fascinating is they have kind of made the argument that's pretty compelling that his whole notion of a genera above species, the whole category that was one of the parts of the architecture of his system came out of his note taking. Like it originally started as just a way to organize things. Um, but then it became so useful that he kind of realized that he thought it was kind of embedded in nature itself. So some of these note-taking practices, like I said, often generate whole new ideas. Or it's a later period, but I sometimes will talk about 19th century, the women at Harvard Observatory who dealt with spectro spec um, spectrometry readings, like when they would take images from stars from far away, they'd run them through a spectrograph and create this band of light and dark, these Fraunhofer lines, and they didn't know what to do with it, and so they, but they thought it was important, so they just kept thousands of these kind of spectrographic fingerprints, and they gave them to the women at the observatory and said, organize it. Women do well with organizing things like catalogs and whatnot. Um, and so they ended up organizing it in a way that is actually the fundamental architecture of how we now classify stars. So the women at the observatory, and I shouldn't say, I mean, they were also seen as having real skill for other reasons, but my, my basic point is that organizing information often leads to lots of conceptual breakthroughs and important things. So that's kind of the theme of, I guess, one of the takeaway lessons of today is about how these little things, a compass, a commonplace book, a little electrical generator, are the stuff that can kind of um, change how people view the world and how they interact with it. So I will stop there. I'm sorry. Thank you. Over. Thank you so much. Fascinating stuff. If you can if you can put a chair one chair away great